Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? Maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. We'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes. We'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community. We believe that it's our job to make it a better place. No matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're with us today. We hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out his plan for us. Welcome to Craig Albert Church. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for connecting today and being with us here at Craig Albert Church Online. I say it every week, but if this is your first time being with us, thanks for coming to church. We have no idea who is watching each week and we know that people all over the world tune in. But it's great to have you here today. And I believe as we come again to worship and open God's word together, this is going to be a short time together. We try and keep these services to around 45 minutes. But it's a short time, but a significant time where I believe God can still move in our lives, even in the strangest circumstances of what we've faced over these past months. The restrictions are starting to lift a little and there's a wee bit more freedom coming into play. And we're getting to go and explore different areas we've maybe not been able to go to, go and visit family and friends in other parts of the country. But here we are today, taking just a moment to come into God's presence, to hear God's voice. And later on, Stuart Bowles is going to speak to us and continue our series in the life of Elijah. One of the things I love about online church is that we've got the ability to catch up. And if you miss any of the services, you can just go to YouTube or on our Facebook thread and you can find out and you can hear these messages. Or if you want to revisit them, you get the chance to do that. So as we come today, I just want to pray. And I don't know what you've experienced this week. I know in our own church and in, in our own families who are watching just now, there has been heartache. There's been difficulty. There's been hardship. And I just want to pray right now. And I want to ask God's blessing on everyone, no matter what it is that we're going through and no matter where it is that we are. So let's just pray just now and then we'll continue into a time of worship together. Father, we praise you that we can come now And we can come to worship and give you all the glory for who you are. And we can come expecting to see what it is that you want to do in our lives and through our lives. And I pray, Lord, that today you would meet us right where we are. That you would help us, Lord, in times of sorrow and grief. That we would celebrate, Lord, in the times of joy and rejoicing. But I recognise, Lord, that today as we come and as we explore what your word says you want to speak. So be with Stuart, Lord, as he shares, but Lord, be with us as we open our hearts and as we look to see what it is you want to say today. We pray this in your name. Amen.
This old friend of mine, Helen. My best friend. My friend Colin invited me to try Alpha. Y recuerdo que mi papá me dijo, mira, hay comida gratis, ve. They handed me a invitation. It was just a random invitation. And I said like, why not? Why not? Let's try it. Why not? Let's go. And I found like a like a really awesome community of people. They helped me find who I was just by listening. Alpha helped me in the knowing of God. Empecé a entender que el amor es de muchas maneras. I just knew. I was a different person from that moment on. I knew I had purpose. I, I felt really comfortable in like starting to invite my friends. I've seen Alpha really impact people that I work with. I would definitely encourage people to get involved. It's one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. It all turned out to be life changing. Last Monday night we had our first session of Alpha Online. It was really exciting to see all these screens and um, fill up with people on Zoom last Monday for just a quick hour as we looked at the first session. Is there more to life than this? And this week we're looking at the whole question of who is Jesus. Really quite excited to get back and to see all these faces. But I want to tell you, if you would like to join an Alpha course, then we're able to facilitate these at other times in the day. Maybe a Monday night doesn't suit you and another time would suit you better. But I would love to speak to you about that. So if you want to discover and explore what life and faith looks like when it's combined, as I always say, then why don't you get in touch with me way now? But we're looking forward to another session on Monday for those that joined us. Thanks for being there. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall, and thought of me, above all. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Laid behind the stone, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all. Bye. Late behind.
on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all Good morning folks, or maybe even good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you're watching this video. It's great to have you with us today, whenever and wherever you're watching. We're going to continue our study this morning into this prophet Elijah, and we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 18. There's a lot to get through this morning, so we'll get cracking on and straight into it. So if you've got a Bible, or a tablet, or a smartphone with a Bible app on it, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. And we're going to read a few short, short verses from there. 1 Kings 18, and we'll read from verse 17 down to verse 21 initially. And this is what it says. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house, because you've abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go on limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Later on in May, as a country, we will go to the polls. And I'm sure after deliberating and watching endless debates and reading the numerous pamphlets that come through the door, on that day, we'll put a cross in the box and declare the person and party that we want to support in taking the country forward. This day was a, an election day, if you like, for Israel. They had to declare here today who they were going to follow. Were they going to follow God or were they going to follow Baal? And if you remember from last week when John was taking us through chapter 17, we read that King Ahab was a ruler in Israel. And the Bible reminds us that he did more evil in the sight of God than any other king before him. He had introduced the worship of Baal into Israel and he had also married Jezebel who introduced the worship of Asherah. Jezebel herself tried to get rid of the worship of God by killing all of the prophets of God, and only a hundred of them managed to escape and were saved through a man named Obadiah. And the people of Israel had quite willingly followed the king and their queen in worshipping Baal. And I suppose you can understand when you think about it some of the reasons and some of the logic for them doing that. Not only were the king and queen encouraging and following worshipping Baal, but some of the other nations around about Israel worshipped Baal as well. And you know what it's like? Sometimes you look at something that your neighbours got and you want that as well. You think the grass is always greener on the other side. So that had an influence on the people of Israel. Baal was also known as the storm and fertility god. And he bestowed upon man and the land fruitfulness. He was a god of lightning and fire and rain and he sent the rain in season so that the land could produce its crop. And for a farming nation like Israel, you could understand the attraction of worshipping a god like this. But I suppose moreover, most important of all, with Baal worship, there was no accountability. There was no challenge. There was no self-examination. You could live as you like. Do as you pleased, and Baal would still produce. As a result of their disobedience, we heard last week how God had stopped the rain from falling and sent a famine in the land. And he sent Elijah the prophet to go and tell the king about this famine and about the rain from stopping to fall. It's now three years later since that event took place. There's been no rain in three years and the land is suffering a severe famine. The king himself has gone out to look for water elsewhere. 
to try and keep some of the animals alive. And God is about to step in and to make it rain. But rather than just causing the rain to fall and watch as the people and the king and the queen and all the prophets give worship to Baal and praise to Baal, thinking it was Baal who had made the rain to fall, God orchestrates this showdown on Mount Carmel to demonstrate that he and he alone is God. And the reality is that that is what this passage is all about. It's all about God demonstrating that he is God. And just as we read through this passage, we read several times the phrase, the Lord is God. And that's the challenge that Elijah gives to the people right at the start here. He says, if the Lord is God, then follow him. And just as that much as that challenge applies to the people at this time, that challenge also applies to you and me today. For us to declare who we're following, for us to declare that if the Lord is God, then we're following him, and if not, we're rejecting him and going our own way. But there's a couple of aspects of God's character, of God's personality that are revealed to us in this section that demonstrate that God is in fact the only true God. And it's those aspects that I want to bring to you this morning for us to take a look at. And the very first one we see in these few verses that we've read together this morning, and that is God is a God of grace and mercy and willing to forgive. Here, despite the Israelites turning away and following Baal and worshipping him, God provides them with an opportunity to repent and to be restored back into the covenant relationship with him. And if you read through the history of the Israelites from Exodus onwards, it's a pattern that's often repeated. If you go back to all that God has done for them in bringing them out of oppression and slavery and bondage in Egypt, taking them through the wilderness and providing for their every need, even helping to defeat enemies on each side of the Israelites that would seek to attack them and destroy them, and then eventually bringing them into the promised land. He's done so much for them. But if you read through that story, you read time and time again, the Israelites disobeying God, turning away from him and following another path. But yet what is so remarkable is that for every time that the Israelites turn away and disobey God, God provides them with an opportunity to turn back. He provides them with an opportunity to repent and to be restored back into that relationship with him. And here we are again on Mount Carmel, where the Israelites have disobeyed God, they've abandoned him, they've turned from following him and worshipping him to worshipping Baal. And yet God again provides them with an opportunity to repent and to be restored into that relationship with himself. And it's no different for you and I. The Bible reminds us in Romans 3 and 23 that all of us, you, me, John, everyone has at some point disobeyed God. We've sinned against him. And the prophet Isaiah reminds us that we have all, like sheep gone astray, we've turned to our own way. We've sought self-satisfaction. We've sought self-righteousness. We've sought to be masters of our own destiny, not to be held accountable for anything that we've done. Like the people of Israel here, we've sought to follow a God that's a God of our own making, one who doesn't challenge us, one who we're not held accountable to. But despite our disobedience, God in his grace and in his mercy and in his willingness for, to forgive affords us the opportunity to be restored back to him. Second Peter 2 and 9 reminds us that God is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come into that relationship with him and acknowledge him as Lord and God of their lives. I don't know where you are in your journey of faith, I don't know if, like the Israelites, you had once followed God, but have since turned away and gone your own path. Or whether you haven't taken that first step of faith yet in acknowledging the Lord is God and turning your life around and following him. 
Federalet gest i di. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, you've got an opportunity to repent and to be restored into that relationship with God. For that opportunity for God to show his grace and his mercy and his willingness to forgive you in your life. Is that an opportunity that you'll take today? But let's read on and see what else we discover about God in this passage. The next thing we discover is that God is always in control. Let's read from verse 22 down to verse 25. It says this, Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it into pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of the Lord your God and put no fire to it. You know, the reality is that no matter who comes out and top in the election in May, they're never really ultimately in full control. And I suppose we've learned that over the last year. Look at something simple like a virus that started in the Far East and yet over a matter of weeks spread right around the world causing unforeseen challenges and changes to our way of life. And you might be forgiven for thinking here that God is not in control in this situation or that somehow he's outnumbered. After all, this has taken place on Mount Carmel where Baal would have been worshipped, so he has home advantage, if you like. In addition to the people of Israel and to the king who are there, there's also 450 prophets of Baal. And on the other side, there's one guy, Elijah. In addition, the prophets of Baal get to go first. But he just, as we saw last week, Elijah had faith that no matter how impossible the situation seemed, no matter how challenging the situation seemed, no matter how bleak the situation seem, seemed, he had knowledge and he had faith that God was in full control. Whether that was facing the king and risking his life to bring him the message about the famine, or whether that was relying on God to provide for him during that famine in the wilderness, or whether that was the faith to rely that God would use this widow who had so little to provide for him and herself and her son. And even when her son passed away, Elijah knew that God was in full control and that nothing was impossible for him. And the same applied in this situation. Despite the numbers, despite the apparent disadvantage, despite the fact that they were on Baal's home turf, and they got to go first. Elijah knew that God was in full control of this situation. You know, the Bible reminds us in the book of Job and in Proverbs that the plans of God cannot be thwarted. No plan can succeed against his. He is a sovereign Lord, the creator and sustainer of the universe. Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing catches him off guard. And as a Christian, that provides us with a, a tremendous amount of hope and comfort and security and certainty. We suffer the same strifes in life that anybody else suffers. We live and survey and survive in the chaos of a broken world. But yet we know that no matter what happens, God is in full control and his plan and his will will be done and nothing can thwart it. And therefore, no matter what we face in life, no matter the challenges or the difficult circumstances we find ourselves in, we can have comfort and we can have certainty and we can have insurance that our God is in control. 
I wonder, do you experience that in your life? Do you experience that comfort? Do you experience that peace? Do you experience that hope and certainty that comes from knowing no matter what you face, God is in full control and in full control of your destiny? Not only do we know that God is in full control, but as we read on, we find that God is never too busy. Let's read from verse 26 down to verse 29. This is what it says. And they took the bull, that's the prophets of Baal, that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they limped around the altar they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. You can picture the scene here, can't we? At the top of this mountain. The altar is prepared, the wood is there, the sacrifice is prepared, everything is in place. And here you have these 450 prophets circling around the altar, crying out for all their worth on Baal to answer them. And they do this for at least three hours with the king and the Israelites and Elijah watching on. But nothing happens. After three hours, Elijah starts to take the mickey out of them, as we would say in this country. He says, maybe, maybe your God is musing, maybe he's thinking about other things. He's, he's God after all, he must have more than this on his mind. He says, so maybe he's in the toilet. Maybe he's in the loo and you need to call on him louder so that he can hear you. Or maybe he's travelling somewhere else. There are other nations that worship this God. Maybe he's gone to visit one of those nations and you need to shout louder so he can hear you. Or maybe he's just asleep and he needs to be woken up from his slumber. So we read that they intensify their shouts, they get louder and louder and they even begin to cut and mutilate themselves trying to get their God to take notice of them, to take an interest in their pleas. But yet, verse 29 tells us all that we need to know about this false God that they were worshipping. It says there was no voice, there was no answer, and no one paid attention. As we see on as we go through this passage, that's not the reality for the one true God. He does answer. He does pay attention. He does respond. And that's remarkable when you think of all that God has to do. You think about there are 7.67 billion people in this world. There's the world itself. There's the galaxy. There's the universe. There's all of heaven. And God has to take care of it all. But yet, here is what the psalmist says about God. He says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it together. Despite all that God has to contend with, despite all that he has to take care of, the Bible reminds us that he has a very deep, and personal and intimate knowledge of you. And his desire is for you to share in that relationship. His desire is for you to know him just as he knows you. Do you know God in that way? Have you responded to God in that way? And as we see in this passage... If we respond to God the way Elijah responds to God, in faith and in trusting him and acknowledging him as Lord and God, then God will answer us. But not only is he a God who answers, he is a God 
who delivers. Let's read from verse 30 down to verse 39. This is what it says. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put wood on the altar and cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars of water and pour it on the burnt offering in the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah faithfully rebuilds the altar of the Lord that had once sat there and had been torn down. He then goes a step further. After he's prepared the altar and the sacrifice, he digs this trench around the altar that could hold about four gallons of of water and he gets these jars of water and he fills them up and he empties them over the sacrifice and the wood till the whole thing is absolutely soaked and this trench that he's dug round about the altar is filled with water and he does this to demonstrate that what is about to happen is no mere freak accident but it's the intentional work of God you see this sacrifice is so wet the wood is so sodden that even a gallon of petrol wouldn't set it in fire and when the time for the offering came Elijah didn't have to run around the altar and cry out many many times like the prophets of Baal had to do over and over again getting louder each time so that God would hear him no he simply acknowledged the Lord as God and that he was acting in faith according to God's word, and that it was God himself who was turning the hearts of the people back to him. And what happened? God answered. Fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. Not only the sacrifice and the wood, but the stones and the dust and all that water that was poured over the sacrifice and in the trench, the fire consumed it all. Can you imagine being there in that crowd on that day. Can you imagine what it would be like standing there as an Israelite and witnessing this fire coming from heaven and consuming this sacrifice? Not only would the sight of this miracle be amazing in your own eyes, but for the Israelites it would have brought back memories from their past, from their history. Back when their nation was in the wilderness and the first tabernacle and the first altar was set up, Fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. And then more recent in our history, when Solomon had finished building the temple and the sacrifice was prepared again, fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. Both of these events signifying God's willingness to forgive and to accept and to dwell with his people. The same conclusion that happened then was also the same conclusion and response that happened here on Mount Carmel. As God showed up and displayed his power, the people responded by acknowledging that God is the Lord. I wonder how would you have responded on that day if you were one of the Israelites in the crowd and you witnessed all that took place? Would you acknowledge that the Lord is God? 
after witnessing such a miracle. You might very well say, well, that's all well and good for the Israelites on the top of Mount Carmel who got to see that. Why doesn't God do something similar today? Why doesn't God rip the sky apart and come down in a pillar of fire for everyone to see today? And then surely we'll all acknowledge that the Lord is God. Why doesn't he do that? Well, actually, the truth is, he has done it. The Bible reminds us in Hebrews that in the past, God spoke through the prophets like Elijah. And he spoke through them in many ways, like this incident here on Mount Carmel. But he says, in these last days, in the days that you and I are living in, God spoke through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the reality is God has come down, but not in a pillar of fire. He has come down in the person of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this time not to consume a sacrifice, but this time to be a sacrifice. Exchanging his perfect, sinless, spotless life on the cross of Calvary for mine and for your imperfect life. A life of disobedience and rejecting God's plan and purpose and will for our life. And he did so so that we could be brought into that covenant relationship with God. That if we acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviour and put our faith and trust in him, then we can be forgiven. And God will respond to us if we cry out in faith. Cleanse us from all the wrong things that we've done. And restore us into that right relationship with him. That is what he's done for you and for me. And you might say, well, where is the evidence for all of that? Where is the evidence to prove that God has come down? It's right here in this book. It's right here in the lives of the Christians that attend this church. It's right here in the lives of the Christians all over the world who have their lives transformed all because of what God has done for them through the Lord Jesus Christ in the cross of Calvary. And that change and that answer and that response and that restoration and that bringing you back into the right relationship with God can be yours if you acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. There's one other thing we find out about God in this passage and it would be remiss of me not to mention it to you this morning. And the last thing is this, God is just. Let's read what the final verse in this section says. It says in verse 40, And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let none of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. You think, whoa, what a way to end this story. Here is this miraculous event taking place where God shows up in such a mighty and powerful way and demonstrates to the people that he and he alone is God. He's a God of grace and mercy and a willingness to forgive. He's a God who is never too busy to respond to them. He's a God that shows up and delivers them. But he's also a God who is just. You see, this is a demonstration that God is a just God because the law at the time in Deuteronomy 13 says that if any prophet would entice the people of Israel away to follow another God, then their punishment is capital punishment. They must be put to death. Therefore, as God is God and he is just, this could have been the only outcome for the prophets of Baal, that they were put to death. If God wasn't just, if God wasn't true to himself and true to his word, then he would cease to be God. And we couldn't put our faith or our trust or our hope in a God who wasn't just and true to himself. But the fact that God is just should be a wake-up call to each and every one of us today. You see, while we are living in the times of God's grace, and while he affords us the opportunity to respond to him, to acknowledge him as God, and to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviour, the Bible reminds us that there will come a time 
when that opportunity ends, and it'll be no more. And we will all stand in front of a holy God and have to give an account for our lives. And in that day, a just God will judge us. And if we are found wanting, if we are found in disobedience, then the penalty for us is eternity in hell. That's the reality. That's what the Bible teaches. But if while the opportunity is available to us, we've acknowledged the Lord as God, we've accepted Christ as our Saviour, then when we stand before him, we won't be condemned. Instead, we'll be forgiven because we're holy and blameless in his sight because Christ has paid the price for it all on the cross of Calvary and we'll spend eternity with him in heaven. That's what's available to each and every one of us today. That's a challenge for each and every one of us today, for us to declare whether the Lord is God and if he is, to follow him and to follow him wholeheartedly. I hope that today you take that opportunity to acknowledge him and to respond and he will surely answer and deliver you. Let's just pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you today. We acknowledge, Father, that you are God, that you are sovereign and you are in control. We acknowledge, Father, that you have done all that you can for each and every one of us in the sending of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sins on Calvary, that we might be restored and reconciled and brought into a right relationship with you if we will only acknowledge him as Lord and Saviour of our lives. Father, we pray that everyone who is watching today will have taken that step of faith, taken that step of faith of re in response to acknowledge you as Lord and God of our lives. Father, thank you for all that you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, and equip us and strengthen us to continue to follow you and to follow your will and plan and purpose for your life, knowing with all a certainty what lies ahead and what's in store for us. Father, we give you thanks for your word. Bless it to us. May you speak to each and every one of us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Stuart, thanks for that powerful message. And I believe that God is speaking to somebody even today through what Stuart shared with us. It's amazing to see the contrast, isn't it, between those who are crying out to God's that are only going to answer and ignoring the God who can answer all their needs. And if you want to connect with us and talk about anything that Stuart said today, then please get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. So the Lord bless you until we see you again. Some of you will see you tomorrow night at Alpha. For others, we'll see you on Tuesday night for our prayer time that we're going to have at 8 o'clock on Zoom. And failing that, we'll see you again next Sunday as we come online. And remember, share these services with the people that are around you and the contacts that you have and those that you love. You never know, God might just speak into somebody's life in a way that you could never imagine. The Lord bless you and take care.